welcome back to Morbidly Bewitched. In the last video, I carried out an experiment that I think went very well on Little Martin the Meat Man, if you want to check that out. And it's only natural, considering all of my past episodes has been about decay and decomposition, that this video I'm going to discuss the arch enemy of decay, and that is preservation. This is going to be one of many videos, I would say, dedicated to this topic of preservation. Not only would it be one of my favourites being an embalmer, but to do with the entire death industry, preservation is a key topic of how we treat our deceased in our funerary practices. As humans, we are so repulsed by everything that decomposes and all nature of things associated with that, it was only predictable that years ago we would try and experiment with different chemicals and compounds to render or stave off this natural process completely. Our fascination and determination to master this field of expertise is probably best practiced in the funeral industry. So I'm going to take you on a little educational journey through the process. Even with basic knowledge of chemistry, when people think of mortuaries, morticians, and funeral homes, and embalming, there is one thing that usually springs to mind. Formaldehyde. Good old formaldehyde. In the embalming practice, there are many different chemicals and compounds used in a mixture to embalm a body. This is called an arterial solution. However, today in this episode, I'm going to concentrate specifically on formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is a colourless... It's a postman. Formaldehyde is a colourless gas that's pungent in odour in its natural form. And yes, it does occur naturally. It's endogenous to humans, plants and animals alike in trace amounts. It can be found almost everywhere. However, it can also be synthetically recreated. Automatic cat feeder. It can also be synthetically recreated on an industrial scale for things like the building trade, medical grade, and the beauty industry, not just for embalming. Formaldehyde was first synthesized by a Russian chemist called Alexander Butlerov in 1859, however truly identified for use by a German scientist in 1868 called August Willem von Hoffmann. The method identified for synthesizing formaldehyde was the vaporization through oxidation method. Simplified, this is when methanol and air are passed over a heated coil, a metal catalyst, in this case a platinum coil. This turns into vapor and the vapor itself is then collected in a water solution. Because this vapor is soluble, it turns into an aqueous solution called formalin. Formalin can then be sold in different strengths by different volumes of saturated formaldehyde in the aqueous solution, or formalin. This is of course just one example of different ways that you can synthesize formaldehyde. However, to this day, it is still the most common used method. And yes, for all of you chemists out there that may have tuned in to watch this, this is an extremely simplified version of the process, but you get the gist. So how did it get so highly recognized in the funeral industry? Well, skip forward a few years to 1893. It was a Jewish scientist called Ferdinand Blum from Frankfurt that had a look at formaldehyde and truly seen its potential in the ability to fixate tissue. With Ferdinand's research showing such potential and its capabilities in the preservation of human tissue, that's whenever it started to gain its notoriety in the funeral industry. And it rose to fame. Now, a common misconception would be that some people do think in the funeral industry and embalming, whenever a body is embalmed, it is just formaldehyde and nothing else. That is not true. There is many different chemicals that make up 
what a body is embalmed with. There are different disinfectants, fixative agents. Formaldehyde is the main one for fixating the tissue, but there's bactericides, there is dyes, there is humectants so that the body doesn't completely dry up and it stays moist. These mixtures are called arterial solutions because they are not just formalin. The reason formalin is still used today in biology and science and funeral homes is because of its main ability, which no other chemical can seem to recreate or top or come close to, is its ability to fixate tissue. Not only does formalin act as a disinfectant, but it has this amazing ability to react with proteins in the cells. Formalin latches onto uh, primary amine groups and protein cells and then it attaches itself to neighbouring nitrogen atoms. This causes a cross-linked effect, which means they cannot readily move about the body, fixating them in place. This then has a knock-on effect with anything trying to get to or move away from the organic structure, like pathogens or bacteria. That is also why there is a palpable difference between an embalmed body and a non-embalmed body. An embalmed body will be rigid and stiff to the touch and a non-embalmed body will be more floppy and pliable and waxy to the touch. There is a downside of course to formaldehyde like most chemicals. In very small trace amounts it's harmless. In fact it's quite necessary for all life. However, in concentrated doses, it becomes a very well-known carcinogenic, which means cancer-causing agent for humans and animals alike. It has now, because of that, been banned in a few states across America and with green funerals and carbon footprints being put in place, we could slowly see the dwindle of the use of formaldehyde in the funeral industry in years to come. The argument being that thousands of litres of this stuff is being buried in our soil year in, year out. Now let's get to the interesting stuff. Because I am a curious little creator, I wanted to show you in some way the difference between an embalmed body and a non-embalmed body, but I can't show you real bodies. So I've decided to run another little experiment, which will be in my next video. How could I do that? I hear you ask. I'm going to embalm a sausage. Oh yes. This is going to be Frank and this is going to be Steve. Sorry, I couldn't say that without laughing. Steve's not going to be embalmed, but Frank's going to be embalmed. And I'm going to show you the difference by comparison of what happens over the course of a fortnight to Frank and Steve. This will hopefully give you a very, very rough idea of the difference between uh, embalming and non-embalming. It should be good. So uh, I would want to point out at this stage as well that you can follow me on Instagram at morbidly.bewitched and I will see you in my next episode. Please subscribe. Thank you.